Um, so the first speaker for the session is Professor Scott Slovic. Uh, professor Scott Slovic is a university distinguished professor of the environmental humanities at the University of Idaho in the United States. He served as the founding president of the Association for the Study of Literature and Environment, ASLE, from 1992 to 1995 and since 95 has edited ISLE. Interdisciplinary Studies in Literature and Environment, the Central Journal in the Field of Ecological Literary Studies, and ASLE and Oxford University Press. The author, editor, and co-editor of 27 books, much of his current research and teaching focuses on the perception and communication of information in the context of humanitarian and environmental crisis. I welcome you, sir. Um, the second speaker for the session is Dr. Andreas Alexander Wansbro. Dr. Alexander Wansbro is the author of the forthcoming book, Capitalism and the Enchanted Screen on Social Media. He's the managing editor of the Journal of Asia Pacific Pop Culture, published by Penn State, the co editor of the journal, Alterity Studies and World Literature, and a convener of the annual Inhuman Screens Conference. He teaches film, media, and art theory and history at the University of Sydney and Oro University, Surat, India. I welcome you, sir. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this uh, really visionary international conference on imagining the post-colonial uh, coronavirus world. Uh, I uh, welcome all the speakers. I won't take a lot of time because uh, you have 15 minutes each and we are overstepping the time already because we're all trying to cope with new technology. So it's great to have four continents and 10 countries represented. Uh, may I welcome Professor Scott Slovic to present his paper. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Am I audible now? Yes. Yeah, well, hello everyone. Uh, it's late in the evening uh, where I am in the Western, uh, state, Amer Western American state of Oregon um, around 11.30 at night. Um, and I would like to uh, thank all of you for attending uh, this meeting and especially I'd like to thank our hosts at Oro University, a university devoted to integral and transformational learning as well positioned to host precisely this kind of meeting. The uh, title of my remarks, which I prepared uh, in a scramble this week, like many of you um, hurrying to get ready for this conference, the title is COVID World, COVID Mind, Toward a New Consciousness in the Ongoing COVID Reality. As all of you know, it's exceedingly difficult to speak in the midst of a historical moment about what the future implications of this moment may be, this is obviously one of the challenges we're thinking about during this weekend's conference with participants from many different regions of the world, all of us convinced that something unique and consequential is happening during the COVID-19 pandemic, something we need to contemplate and try to understand. Although the current pandemic is a relatively acute moment of crisis rather than a sprawling diffuse accumulation of social and ecological concerns, it seems to me that this phenomenon is akin to the new world authors Paul Ehrlich and Robert Ornstein recognized in the late 1980s when they published their book, New World, New Mind, Toward a Conscious Evolution. These writers, one a population biologist, the other a psychologist, felt that the modern world had come to pose existential challenges to the human species. From the proliferation of handguns among ordinary citizens in countries like the United States to the nuclear arms race. They also recognized the AIDS crisis of the 1980s, a possible precursor to today's zoonotic pandemic as a grave threat to human survival. They understood, remember, Ehrlich was writing as a population biologist, an expert in evolution. They understood that human beings could not evolve biologically in the short term in order to respond to threats we had created through our own cultural and technological inventions. For Ehrlich and Ornstein, the human species needed to evolve intentionally through our own consciousness, 
in order to have a reasonable possibility of persisting in the face of the very challenges we had created for ourselves. This conscious evolution is what they called new mind. I would like to suggest in a very preliminary way that as we experience this new COVID world, this COVID reality that is likely to be an ongoing reality, not a short-lived disturbance, we should be trying to figure out what we can learn from this experience in order to develop new ways of thinking. I call these ways of thinking COVID mind. For the past 30 years, scholars, writers, and artists have taken encouragement from Ehrlich and Ornstein's notion of a potential conscious evolution. Little progress has actually occurred. Steady planetary degradation has unfolded as we plunge ever more deeply into the sixth mega extinction, spewing toxins into the biosphere and CO2 into the atmosphere. The arrival of a novel coronavirus in Wuhan, China in November 2019 has led to the global pandemic, which is not only a tremendous public health and economic crisis, but a unique opportunity for conscious evolution, a moment to reflect and reboot and potentially embrace certain cognitive skills that may help us to be a more resilient species moving forward. These cognitive traits, I would argue, include such ideas as the following. One, a sense of universal vulnerability. Two, a heightened awareness of the human mind's insensitivity to exponential and potentially catastrophic change. Three, a growing awareness that our interactions with the animal world have genuine consequences for human beings as in the zoonotic transmission of disease. And four, an appreciation of what it means to put on the socio-cultural breaks and change the way we live. I imagine we'll be learning about more examples of COVID mind from other talks during this conference. At a time when corporate and political forces are pressing desperately for a quote unquote, return to normal, I believe we should use whatever social support systems we have available to us in our various countries as a way of stabilizing those in our societies who are most economically and medically at risk. But we must also recognize that there will never be a truly post-coronavirus world, a world in which we can place this pandemic in the rearview mirror and say to ourselves complacently, wasn't that a terrible experience? So glad we need not think about it anymore. Even an eventual vaccine and a widely available and effective treatment protocol will not free us from other zoonotic threats. For the sake of our species and for the sake of the many other species with whom we share the planet, we should use this moment as an uninvited but nonetheless valuable opportunity to practice new ways of thinking, to consciously evolve. The COVID world is also the climate change world, the world of mass extinction and devastating toxicity. We must learn to live with and within this reality. We must mind COVID, not merely overcome it. One of the lessons I've been thinking about lately during the recent lockdown is how my own experience of the current crisis is paradoxically one of normalcy and peril. Yes, of course, there's nothing normal about the constant barrage of information about the public health crisis, the suffering of so many people who've contracted the COVID-19 disease, the strain and despair experienced by those serving these patients as medical personnel, the, the desperation of those who are suffering from intensified economic distress and hunger. There is nothing normal or acceptable about this. And yet for those of us who've managed to endure our lockdown situations, our self-isolation in, re in reasonably good health, and who've managed to continue our working lives remotely as we are doing at this very moment through Zoom, there is a kind of normalcy to our lives, even in the midst of the COVID crisis. At the same time, I find myself thinking about the peril of our species in a more acute and visceral way than is normally the case. 
even though I know the world is fraught with peril, with risk and danger, with uncertainty. It seems to me that we should carry away from the current moment the powerful idea that so-called normalcy and so-called peril it coexist paradoxically in an uneasy tension. Today's paradoxical mindset should, I think, be part of what I'm calling the COVID mind, a way of thinking that helps us to be sensitive to the serious threats we and others are facing in the world, even if we do not feel ourselves to be in immediate danger of suffering death or loss in a given moment. For me, normalcy enables us to conduct our daily lives with a certain effectiveness. But peril should keep us on our toes, vigilant and concerned. We are all vulnerable. The other day on April 21st, the eve of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, I watched a documentary about global climate change called The Road to Change, America's Climate Crisis. One especially interesting part of that report for me was an interview the filmmaker did with a Native American man who lives on tiny Ile de Jean Charles in the Gulf of Mexico, the southernmost part of the state of Louisiana. The man who lives in a simple, vulnerable house on stilts on this small island that is now only 400 meters wide and 4,000 meters long, insisted that he did not believe climate change would ever force him to leave his home and move back to the mainland. He seemed not to remember 2005's Hurricane Katrina, which devastated the island and shrunk it to its current size from its earlier nine kilometer width and nearly 20 kilometer length. Nor could he imagine that there would ever be a time in the future when rising sea levels or battering storms would drive residents from their homes. He said, right at this moment, my house is above water. I think of this as a kind of hyper-presentism, an extreme and probably delusional focus on the present moment, unable to remember or imagine. I worry that many of us in our busy, in-the-moment lives are prone to this kind of thinking. We are inclined to accept the present moment as stable and normal, as unchanging. And yet all around us, there are potentially devastating socioeconomic changes, geopolitical changes, and environmental changes that are occurring at a pace and scale we can hardly detect. Jared Diamond referred to such changes in his 2005 book titled Collapse as creeping normalcy, creeping normalcy. Rob Nixon, more recently in the book Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor from 2011, coined the term slow violence to describe our species' extraordinary and often tragic difficulty in apprehending such changes. With regard to the coronavirus pandemic, I hope we can overcome this kind of excessive and pathological focus on the present as a stable normal. Instead, finding a way to remember that our pre-coronavirus normal was neither a good normal for most people in the world or for the planet itself, nor a stable, unchanging condition. I hope we can use the strangeness of, our cur of the current pause in economic and social activity as a sign that human beings can adapt to new ways of living and thinking, responding mindfully to environmental changes. Perhaps one way of responding mindfully to such changes is to recognize, as demonstrated by a team of Dutch scientists in the 1970s, led by Willem Wagenaar, that, mo that human beings almost universally underestimate exponential growth, climate change, or viral pandemics. We are fated to respond flat-footedly, much too slowly, to extreme crises unless we recognize our inherent ability to think exponentially. Perhaps in the coming months, in a year or more, we may achieve a situation where we won't need to be in a radical lockdown as many of us are at the moment. However, I believe, and this is what medical professionals, including my brother, a surgeon, 
tell me, I believe that we will never not have COVID-19 in our midst in the future. We will have to learn to live with the knowledge of this public health threat and all that it can teach us. Likewise, we will never not have to think about global climate change, our toxic land and air and water, mass extinction, human poverty, and so many other daunting and widespread problems. But this doesn't mean we should allow these phenomena to drive us toward numbness or despair. I take heart in a phrase my colleague Mitchell Tomashow used in his 2001 book titled Bringing the Biosphere Home when he wrote, you don't have to be optimistic to be hopeful. I often use this phrase, especially when talking with students. You don't have to be optimistic to be hopeful. Even if there is no reason for us to be optimistic that we will thoroughly and permanently solve the world's problems, our own problems, we can live our lives in a hopeful way, doing our best to overcome small pieces of these larger problems and doing our best to derive meaning from our, to derive meaning from our troubles. I believe it is in this hopeful spirit that we are holding this weekend's conference, speaking to each other, each other in the midst of a crisis we are only beginning to fathom. I look forward to attending as many of these talks as possible, despite the awkward time differences, and those that I can't stay awake to listen to due to the 12 and a half hour time difference between Oregon and India, I hope to watch later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Scott Slovic. Uh, I think you have taken us uh, forward in this first technical session by talking about the COVID mind. Uh, your idea about the conscious uh, uh, evolution that is necessary and, uh, and to keep in mind always the peril, danger and uncertainty and yet to live uh, with, uh, with some hope in changing the world around us. So uh, with those very positive thoughts, um, I would now like to uh, uh, welcome Dr. Andreas Alexander Van Spruer, uh, from the University of Sydney, the title of whose paper is Iron Capital and COVID Communism. So we uh, really, while we appreciate the fact that uh, Professor Slovic has stayed up for us, and it's great to be connected in this way. Um, I think, uh, I, uh, you know, we also have to be very grateful that we have uh, uh, Dr. Wansborough from the Antipodes joining us, the other side of the world. And the title of uh, Dr. Wansborough's paper is Iron Capital and COVID Communism, as I said. Welcome. Thank you. Like thank you, you so much. Mm. Thank you. Uh, can, can you hear me? I can, yes. Perfect. Great. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm just going to start the timer so that I don't talk too long. I have this habit, so I'll make sure to do uh, stay within the 15 minutes. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It's, it's wonderful to be here virtually. Um, you know, it's so good to see people's faces because, you know, of course, with social distancing, it's, it can be quite isolating. Um, I did have a PowerPoint prepared, but I can't seem to get it to share, so that doesn't matter. I can describe what's on the slides and explain it. So, uh, in this uh, talk, I, I want to explore a concept I'm, tr I'm currently working on, which is this concept of I and capital. Um, and I'll explain that in a second. Uh, but I want to also link it to the development of what I'm going to call COVID communism or COVID socialism, uh, whereby we get all these stories in the media and the press about the possibility that what COVID might do is make us realize the need for some alternative economic system, uh, presumably one resembling something akin to either communism or some form of socialism, right? Um, and certainly I've seen a lot of articles about that. So. Uh, just, uh, you know, a week or so ago, uh, President Trump, uh, Trump was uh, urging rebellion and resistance, and there were protesters holding up signs that read, in, in one case at least, I think it was a couple of cases actually, uh, social distancing equals communism, right? 
Uh, I don't think the protester had read the Communist Manifesto, much less the German ideology uh, or uh, capital. Uh, but nevertheless, there was this sort of concern going on that in some ways this was a gateway towards socialism. And what some right-wing protesters thought was a concern and a danger, others like, you know, uh, Slavoj Žižek, you know, courageously argue that yes, this is this is a possible opportunity, uh, however unlikely, uh, for something akin to some new form of communism to emerge. Oh, thank you, that's fantastic. Okay, and so uh, I think you can now see the slide. On the first slide, there's a picture of uh, you know a meme where it's Comrade Trumpsky. This is of course coming from like the Democrat people who are Democrat sympathizing. On the next slide is. Uh, the uh, image of uh, the protester. Now, neither of these are what I would call iron capital. Now, if we go to the next slide, uh, you know, I want to define iron capital as a sort of uh, emergence in the media, which I think is only really possible in a post-war, uh, Cold War context, a post-Cold War context, whereby we start to see in different media forms comparisons between U.S. capitalism, especially U.S. capitalism, and the Soviet Union, or some form of another communist society, right? Uh, and by communist, of course, I don't mean genuinely communist. I mean the sort of horrid sort of caricature of, you know, communism exercised in the 20th century, you know, the, the, the great abominations and so on of, of Sovietism. Um, and Mao, but anyway. Um, uh, so we start to see in media, and this has started, I think, in the very late 90s, uh, these sorts of comparisons between uh, the Soviet Union and capitalism. So, uh, you know, um, and in a way that didn't just critique the Soviet Union, but when it did critique the Soviet Union, also critique capitalism and suggested in some ways that maybe capitalism might go for way of the Soviet Union. So if we go to the next slide. Okay, so for example, we have a great television series, The Americans, which is a fantastic program. I absolutely recommend you all watch it. And what it does is it takes a mixed angle toward the KGB agents uh, who have infiltrated America. And in so doing, it offers a critique of America. It offers a critique of US capitalism, not just Sovietism, where we see Ronald Reagan support the apartheid regime in South Africa, for example. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, we see um, on the next slide, we see, uh, you know, a, a, a still from the program Comrade Detective or poster from the Comrade. For, I, I don't think it's going, but doesn't matter. Anyway, um, and there's a number of different media forms. There's even a comic book called uh, Superman Red Sun, which imagines what would happen if that superhero Superman were um, a, a Soviet. Uh, you know, what became the dictator of the Soviet Union, which is a very weird thought experiment. And in so doing, it offers critiques of capitalism and suggests in some ways there were things that capitalism could learn from the Soviet Union. Very interesting. Okay, so there were a num so there's a number of media forms that seem to explore this. Uh, you know, there was a, talk, a documentary by Adam Curtis that com uh, called Hypernormalization, which links uh, US capitalism with the sort of fall of uh, the Soviet Union and suggests that capitalism is becoming ossified like the Soviet Union, that capitalism has lost a sense of purpose and, and working. And I think that, you know, we definitely are seeing that in relation to the responses to COVID-19. Um, so we see the sense that uh, when, when we hear right-wing figures saying, it doesn't matter if the elderly die out, what's more important is freedom, or when, for example, the scandalous, the scandalous speech by J Boris Johnson emerged, whereby he said, well, we should remain open to business, right? You know, no matter what. Um, so, Boris Johnson, right? Um, and so what we start to see is this sort of uh, concern about the, what, what Naomi Klein calls disaster capitalism. Um, and disaster capitalism is uh, when, for example, uh, capitalism seeks to enrich itself from a disaster. 
to find ways to amplify its profit, uh, no matter for human cost. And certainly that is something we've started to wake up to. Um, and uh, what's interesting though too, is even in one case, I found this one really interesting article written for the New Zealand Herald by someone who's actually quite right-wing. He's a right-wing media commentator. Uh, he's Auckland-based um, and he's a public relations consultant and lobbyist. And he said something really odd, which is very interesting that even someone on the right like him would say this. He says, one thing is clear, free market capitalism is unsurpassed at inventing, creating and producing houses, cars, iPhones, cool sneakers and jeans. We need to get back to it as soon as we can. But if we're wanting to win a war, the system you're looking for is effectively communism. Okay, so we're starting to see, you know, this sort of link between concerns about the future of capitalism with the emergence or re-emergence of a socialist economic system. And so there are countless um, articles comparing capitalist societies with communist um, societies. Uh, so for example, there's been praise for Vietnam. Uh, the Corella, um region has been praised uh, for having flattened um, for COVID curve, as it were. Um, you know, there's articles in the New York Magazine uh, with titles like coronavirus creates an opening for progressivism, also barbarism, uh, a politics and pandemic, um, you know, uh, is another article I came across. The BBC had an article about whether or not this would bring back socialism in some form. Um, and what this signals to me is the fact that, for example, if we think even a little bit ago, a little while ago, um, a disaster like this would have brought about purely despondency, right? There was that great line by Slavoj Žižek, echoed by Mark Fisher, that it was easier to imagine the end of the world than it was to imagine the end of capitalism. Uh, the soci sociologist Jody Dean, for social theorist, has said that that is no longer true, right? That constantly in uh, media, we're starting to imagine different forms to capitalism, right? We're starting to see it in movies, we're starting to see it in comic books, uh, like the one I mentioned, right? Um, and uh, it's, it's something quite curious. And so we're moving beyond what Mark Fisher called capitalist realism, um, whereby he asserted that in some way, uh, whereas, you know, in the 19th century, he didn't say this as me saying it, but in the 19th century, Karl Marx famously began the Communist Manifesto with the great ominous words, a spectre is haunting Europe, the spectre of communism, right? Wonderfully theatrical. Uh, Karl Marx famously actually wanted to be a romantic poet in his youth, uh, and so he, he channeled that sort of language into his great rhetoric, okay? Uh, but, uh, but in a way, Marx was kind of, you know, that was a good old days for capitalism when it was starting up and when its greatest threat was an alternative political economic system. Um, at a certain point, the greatest threat to capitalism, a much worse spectre was its own spectre, its own uh, possible mortality at its own hands, right? And there would be nothing to replace it. And there was this great sense of despondency, uh, which was framed by Fisher in terms of capitalist realism. And so Fisher defines capitalist realism in the following way. He says, capitalist realism presents itself as a shield protecting us from the perils posed by belief itself. The attitude of ironic distance proper to postmodern capitalism is supposed to immunize us, interesting use of words in this context, against the seductions of fanaticism, lowering our expectations we are told in a small, it is a small price to pay for being protected from terror and totalitarianism. Okay, mm -hmm. and of course one of the current specters that is currently being posed, not just communism, is COVID-19, and whether this will mean a turn toward fascism, uh, barbarism, a return to feudalism, some sort of state capitalism, or some sort of alternative. But it has become another area where we start to see the emergence of iron capital. And I think iron capital, that idea of entertaining critiques of the US from the perspective of the Soviet system, uh, suggests that on some level that there is a tendency emerging, however marginally in popular culture, that does confirm Jody Dean's hypothesis that we are starting to imagine alternatives to capitalism, 
whether or not these alternatives will turn out to be uh, examples of full optimism uh, has yet to be seen. But I think it's very interesting that there is now this sort of productive and interesting sort of cultural discourse going on. And um, I have you know, thanks so much for the opportunity. That's that's the uh, end of the presentation. It's still a concept I'm developing. Um, and um, I think I have about four minutes to spare. So uh, excellent. That means someone with something more interesting than myself uh, <laughs> you know, can speak. In fact, I'm, I'm very much listen, waiting forward to hearing about the great Shelley novel for, for, for Last Man in relation to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, COVID-19 and, and the specters it offers. So thanks so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wansbrook. First of all, uh, thank you for your brilliant timing uh, and your generosity in leaving time for the next speaker. Uh, uh, it was great to see uh, you proceeding after the eco-critical stand taken by Professor uh, Slovic, which we hopefully will talk about through the two days and later on in the final session and uh, your own presentation on uh, an iron capital uh, and I, I'm really hopeful that we will have the end of a capitalist era as we rethink uh, the whole uh, post coronavirus world and uh, and I really enjoyed your your multimedia approach and we will look out for the Americans, the series. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll leave the questions till after the session as you might have gathered already. So uh, a warm welcome uh, uh, to Elisabetta Marino, who's an old friend. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, Elisabetta is going to talk about teaching Mary Shelley's The Last Man in the Times of Coronavirus, as Professor Wansborough has already uh, pointed out. Uh, so, Elisabetta, over to thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this online conference for accepting my contribution primarily as a teacher and then as a scholar of English literature. It is a real honor to share some thoughts with you today. Well, starting from the early months of 2020, educators at all levels of the system have been hurried to move their courses to online platforms to guarantee the continuity of lectures and parallel activities. We all have experienced that. Our daily routine has undergone substantial transformations as we have been forced to reassess our priorities and reconsider our habits. Even in the global north, social inequalities have become increasingly evident. Some students and teachers as well grapple with poor internet connections, outdated technology, shared spaces affecting their concentration and learning capacity. The social distancing imposed to prevent a further spread of coronavirus might gradually erode our sense of community. Actually, each person, at least in Italy it is like that, is now perceived as a potential source of infection, as asymptomatic cases are difficult to detect. In these trying times, we are all experiencing humanities, and in my specific case, the study of literature are entrusted with a crucial function. By carefully selecting texts our students can relate to during the present crisis, we can fruitfully employ the artistic output of authors included in our syllabi to ponder on our current situation, thus emphasizing the ethical usefulness of literature and its key social role. The case of Mary Shelley's The Last Man proves particularly relevant in this respect, and I'm going to delve into that. Published in 1826, 
after the death of both Percy Shelley and Lord Byron, The Last Man features the possible extinction of humankind due to a devastating pandemic, which spreads across the world in the last three decades of the 21st century. Actually, the novel starts in 2073. The novel has long been regarded by critics and biographers as a Roman Aclef, disguising the members of Mary's treasured circle of friends as fictional characters. Several scholars have also interpreted it by focusing on the failure of the eschatological expectation stemming from the outburst of the revolution in 1789. Most researchers have associated a thoroughly pessimistic and disturbing outlook to the narrative. Conversely, Shelley's gloomy representation of the future, which, as readers gather from the frame narrative, is nothing but an ominous prophecy, should be interpreted as a warning, as a cautionary tale. As it strikingly resonates with the student's present experience of lockdown, fear, and impending danger, the last man somehow enables them to focus on the issues that may have contributed to the catastrophe in the novel, as well as to the several world emergencies, not just COVID-19, we are all facing nowadays. And these issues are human greed, neo-colonial practices or colonial practices in the case of Mary Shelley and a short-sighted disregard for nature and its balance. As some of you may not be familiar with the plot, I will very briefly summarize it. During a visit to the Sibyl's cave near Naples, so this is the important part because there is a frame narrative and then the body of the text. So there is this frame narrative where the, the, the two narrators uh, of the introduction uh, find some Sibylline leaves carrying inscriptions and decide to decipher them, thus discovering a story narrated by the last man, Lionel Verney. In the first volume of the Three Decca book, all the main characters are introduced, including Lord Raymond, who, after becoming Lord Protector of England, decides to fight in Greece against the Turks. And this war, as he underlines, will allow his country to expand in Asia. At the beginning of the second volume, after the conquest of a ghastly and desolate Constantinople, a terrible pandemic begins to spread towards the West and finally reaches England, which originally thought itself immune. The third volume chronicles the flight of the decimated English population in search of a milder climate in the south of Europe with the vain hope to survive. At the end of the novel, in 2100, Lionel Verney, the only person who contracted the disease and recovered, remains the last man on earth and decides to sail across the Mediterranean looking for other survivors. And this is the end of the novel. As students soon realize, the pandemic envisioned by Mary Shelley seems to serve as a form of retribution. Indeed, human thirst for power and crass ethnocentrism are severely censored by the writer. At the very beginning of the novel, England is described by Lionel as a, quote, vast and well-manned ship which mustered the winds and rode proudly over the waves." End of quote. The frequent use of colonial imagery, the unmistakable display of imperialistic ambitions and strong feelings of self-praise on the part of some characters, have led Alan Richardson to assert that the last man belongs squarely in the tradition of British colonial discourse. <laughs> 
Lord Raymond actually claims he wants, quote, to unite with the Greeks, take Constantinople and subdue all Asia. Interestingly, the so-called Orient is the source of the pandemic, spreading from the shores of the Nile and affecting several Eastern countries. The other, however, seems unable to contaminate England. Quote, the cloudy island far removed from danger, end of quote. The alleged unbridgeable divide between what we may now term Global North and Global South is thus voiced by one of the characters. And this is a really disturbing passage, really racist. And I quote, the plague, uh, the pandemic is uh, identified with a plague. The plague is of old a native of the East, sister of the tornado, the earthquake, the samoom. It drinks the dark blood of the inhabitant of the South, but it never feeds on the pale-faced Celt. If perchance some stricken Asiatic come among us, plague dies with him, uncommunicated and anxious." End of quote. This blatant and ostentatious assertion of superiority actually betrays Mary Shelley's intimate descent. Remarkably, the plague arrives in England through an American ship. Albeit unwillingly, the former colony strikes the heart of the empire and exposes its limits. In The Last Man, the pandemic is a product of imperial and colonial contact, the outcome of an encounter between East and West, which has been prompted by no other reason than satisfying the English greed for power and leadership. The author further highlights her intention to challenge the contemporary colonial discourse by calling the migrant survivors a colony. The idea of conquest and expansion, commonly associated with the word, clash against the image of a scant group of frightened refugees struggling to remain alive, while the mighty leveler, the way the pandemic is described in the novel, apparently fills every social and economic gulf. The opening sequence of the novel, portraying England as a powerful ship, as its ironic counterpart in the closing scene, which features the last man about to sail off on his little boat this time. This time the traveler is not heading towards glory or adventure, but towards the unknown, probably death. The wishful denial of the seriousness of the emergency on the part of common citizens and even some politicians, something we have all observed in our countries in relation to the coronavirus. In Italy, for example, some people still believe in conspiracy theories and refuse to take proper precaution, may be exemplified through this sentence, which is ominously reminiscent of Greta Thunberg's exhortation to act in relation to global warming, as if our house were on fire. And I quote from the novel, we were as a man who hears that his house is burning and yet hurries through the streets borne along by the lurking hope of a mistake, till he turns the corner and sees his sheltering roof enveloped in a flame. End of quote. Finally, the last man also offers students the possibility to reflect and elaborate on current ecological concerns that might have a connection with the outburst of COVID-19 and other diseases. The north of Italy, for example, where most factories are located, has been more severely hit by the virus. Mary Shelley depicts the pandemic as nature's reaction against man's mindless exploitation of its resources. And I quote, nature, our mother and our friend, 
as turned on us a brow of menace. She showed us plainly that though she permitted us to assign our laws and subdue our apparent powers, yet if she put forth but a finger, we must quake." End of quote. Indeed, the author lingers on the description In contemplating them. Nonetheless, when the disease starts spreading and the number of victims increases, plants and animals, thoroughly unaffected by the dismal circumstances, take back the spaces that have been previously denied and thrive. And this is what is happening here in Italy, for example. Nature is blooming. We, we, are, we have a wonderful spring and animals are all over the place. Teaching the last man at the times of coronavirus can also offer the opportunity to convey an empowering message to the students. It should not be forgotten that the frame story, the frame narrative, takes place in 1818 and that the body of the narrative is a mere prophecy of the Cumean Sibyl, or better still, what the decipherer understood by putting together scattered, unconnected, and at times unintelligible fragments of Sibylline leaves. The ominous epigraph from Paradise Lost, quote, let no man seek henceforth to be foretold what shall befall him or his children, words that Adam utters after the Archangel Michael shows him a vision of the deluge, is balanced by the reassuring knowledge that in this case no Archangel is involved and the future could turn out to be much different if an attentive ear were lent to the story. Selecting insightful and thought-provoking texts, therefore, is particularly important at a time when students are maybe more receptive, at least my students are, they're really more receptive, and in search for guidance. To quote the sentence by Noam Chomsky included in the concept note of this conference, Possibly a good side of the coronavirus is it might bring people to think about what kind of world we want. Well, Mary Shelley's pandemic novel may show us what world we don't want and how to avoid it. Thank you. Uh, we can't hear. We can't hear you. Ah, can you, you can, I had to unmute it, sorry. Thank you very much, Elisabetta, for your pedagogic approach in rethinking the canon, literary canon, and showing how pertinent texts can be reread today to give us lessons. And I think Mary Shelley was way ahead of her time, yeah. uh, both with The Last Man and Frankenstein. Uh, and I mean, even the last scene is very much like Frankenstein, where the creature is shown go, uh, push, uh, pulling his sled in a lonely search for his end. So I think uh, we have had three very reflective papers uh, on thinking about transformation, uh, which this whole conference is about. Uh, I know we've come to the end uh, do we have time for one or two questions? Om? Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, please. Please go ahead. So, Take, I, uh, could we, how do I know if anybody has a question? Okay. There's mm -hmm. one from uh, Atul Nair, uh, has a comment on um, uh, Professor Slovic's paper. Would you like to speak? Uh, Professor Scott Slovic, I believe this is, no? Yeah, yeah, and there's also another one from uh, Jim Wilson who wants to pose a question. So 
Can we enable them to yeah. speak? Uh, uh, Scott, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. I, I see. Now I need to call up the question. Um, yes. So the question, yeah. the comment is, is our flat-footed yeah. response to the pandemic could be because the pandemic for us is what Timothy Morton calls a hyper object of planetary proportions. So the pandemic is difficult to fully comprehend as climate is as difficult to comprehend um, as climate change. And I, I would agree. And this is what I was trying to say in my brief comment about um, exponential growth or change, um, change that happens in a, a certain pattern uh, at a certain pace um, is very difficult to perceive. Much of what I was attempting to suggest is that we are very limited in our perception of, of environmental and public health phenomena. Um, it's a psychological limitation and insensitivity that we have. Um, this, is, this pertains to speed or pace and also to size. And Morton seems particularly engaged with issues of, of size and scale that, that exceed our perception and prevent us from reacting properly. So I agree, it's appropriate to bring up hyper objects in this context, also very closely related to the slow violence idea. Thank you for that comment. Okay, there's a yeah. question for all panelists. Andrea, Can you tell us how the government... Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, uh, there is a question for Andreas. Andreas. And then there's a question for all panelists as well. And so can we, can we have yeah, the question? We don't have time to... We don't have time to entertain all the questions. I think they can send out through email as well later. But let us take this question from J.M. Wilson uh, for Andreas. Okay, um, I'm ready for the question. That's right, yeah. Uh, it seems to be listed um, uh, in the, uh, the chat Can you place button. your question you again? If you hit the chat I can't button, read it. you'll see yeah. the question. If you... No. Should I read that out for you, uh, Alex? Uh, yes. I'm hitting you, but it's not coming up. Yeah. So, oh, here. James, yes. This, this is a question which asks you, can you tell us how the government bails out to business and employers? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us how the government bailouts to business and employers are evidence of a socialist economy or microsystem emerging? How do these fit into your paradigm? Uh, okay, um, a good question. Uh, the answer is, I mean, in a way, there's a great line by, you know, there's a great concept that we find often in Marxist theory, which relates to the idea of, you know, it's a future in some sense that determines the past and how we frame the past. This was very much an idea in uh, Walter Benjamin's Theses on History, you know, a, a wonderful work, very uh, messianic, slightly mystical, but certainly still in, in many ways quite Marxist. Um, and my response is that the bailouts can be read as an attempt in many ways to save capitalism, to keep capitalism going. In many cases, the bailouts are to industries we don't need and that don't really help or serve the interests of workers. Like if you think about, for example, for cruise line industry, you know, it's not a, a, a very nice industry. It underpays workers. It's not, it's not something that we actually need. We don't really need cruise ships, for example, you know. Uh, so it, it's too soon to tell whether or not this state intervention, I mean, what's interesting is it does show that state intervention is possible, uh, that we are, we're seeing massive calls for state intervention. Um, you know, and so it does open up that possibility, but of course, how we interpret uh, these sorts of events is, of course, de determined by the future, not, not entirely by how we witness, and witness them now. So some people consider it socialism, others will see it as just another form of capitalism. And of course, in Marxist theory, we have this idea that the state actually serves corporations. So the idea that sort of libertarian right-wing idea that the state and corporations are in, and capitalism are kind of antithetical is not something that Marxists accept. They, they always claim that capitalism needs the state to survive and is actually connected to it. So it's very hard to tell at this stage is, is basically my response. Thank you, thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, I would like to um, just read a comment for, uh, for Elisabetta, uh, that nature, our mother, and, and this is from, uh, uh, well, I can't see who it is uh, because it's a number, but nature, our mother, and friends, excellent words to sensitize human beings, to, and that's for Elisabetta. So, uh, with us for very thoughtful papers, uh, beginning with uh, um, the uh, eco -critic critical um, planetary degradation uh, uh, that, that informed Mrs. Uh, Andreas for taking us through uh, uh, looking at a new possibly socialist world. Uh, and Elisabetta for a reappraisal and a revisionist. I would also like to thank uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Oro University, Om Rivedi, uh, Dr. Om, uh, for organizing this, for inviting us and to together with uh, Singh, uh, whom I met uh, uh, in Rome, and it was lovely to see you again, and Professor Rajan Velikar for, for inviting all of us to bring us together for uh, Professor uh, Naya's earlier invitation. Uh, we've learned a lot, and thank you for uh, uh, to all the panelists. Who join me to thank the panelists and the organizers for this remarkable uh, international conference that looks ahead and makes us think about how we can continue to survive and keep our planet sustained. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Basha. We really 